Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Sick. Okay, just gonna be a bit. Uh, it's a bit of an awkward position, but just go for this. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Awa. I am one of the co-founders of Crypto Labs. Crypto Labs is a uh, validator for public proof of stake networks such as Tezos, Cosmos, or Polkadot, and we are based in Switzerland. So for today, the contents I prepared are the following. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, speaking about why proof of stake is important now. Then I'm going to go for a definition of vocabulary concepts. Um, then I'm going to talk about four variants of proof of stake that I consider most relevant at this point. And I'm going to finish up talking about the role and importance of, um, of token holders, in specifically in this kind of networks. Why is proof of stake especially relevant these days and the upcoming year? Is um, it's been a common proof of stake is a common research topic and has been like that for a while, but not on none of um, but not until but not until the um, the last months all the public blockchains relied on before work, and now we begin to see the very first proof of stake networks running in production environments such as Tezos which is non-trivial because uh, now we can test empirically either of e either these protocols which in theory they work, they can actually achieve the goals they're aiming at with real validator sets this time and not simulations. Will Proof of Stake be able to substitute Proof of Work or will it be able to make blockchains more scalable as, is, uh, as it was in initially intended? What will be the trade-offs that these properties will face? And Lastly, these networks introduce a, um, a requirement that proof of work networks did not have before, which is a high involvement of its token holders, be it as validators or delegators. At this point, I, um, there are two concepts that uh, must be clarified. The definition of consensus algorithm and proof of something. I'm sure that many of you heard that uh, proof of work being defined as a consensus algorithm, even on Wikipedia, proof of stake is defined as a mechanism for distributed systems to achieve consensus. But I discourage referring to them as consensus algorithms because it becomes pretty confusing from now onwards. A more precise way of distinguishing them will be the following one. Consensus algorithms are mechanisms that enable trustless, trustless peers to agree on a specific state or set of data. Proof of something, on the other hand, are mechanisms that um, that uh, are mechanisms that enable that kind of deci that decide what peers are allowed to participate in consensus, and in other words, what requirements nodes need to satisfy in order to participate. And this distinction was, to be honest, not necessary until now because until now all the public blockchains relied on Nakamoto consensus and proof of work. For the scope of this talk, one must know about two consensus algorithms, or two types of them. One of them is Nakamoto consensus, which states that the longest chain e or, or the chain representing the largest pool of consumer electricity is the canonical one. And BFT consensus algorithms are inspired by classical Byzantine fault tolerance research. It is a, it's a subfield in computer science that has decades, uh, uh, decades worth of research yes, into it. Um, those algorithms state that consensus is rich when two thirds uh, of, a validator of a validator set provides the respective signatures in, for example, the latest block. In other words, PFT consensus is characterized for being resilient to a, a maximum one third of the nodes being dishonest. Proof of work is known in. Uh, is, is no, it's pretty well known, we all know how it kind of works. In order to participate in proof of work blockchains, a node has to compete with other nodes in solving a cryptographic puzzle, a computational puzzle, or find the nodes for the next block first. In proof of stake, generally, to participate in consensus, a node must allocate uh, the required amount of value as a collateral, which can be lost when deviating from a protocol. With the proliferation of proof of stake, ironically, the nothing at stake problem started to become apparent. 
nothing at stake refers to the fact that validators can deviate from the protocol as much as they want by causing and maintaining multiple forks, for example, and not cost. The nothing at stake problem is present in both commercial and academic projects. An example is delegated proof of stake, which is used by heavily commercialized projects such as pictures or EOS. In EOS, for example, block producers are run by token holders votes. As long as you are on the top 21 or the following, 20, the following 100 um, ranked by, uh, by votes, the, um, the block producers are guaranteed a reward. And there's no concept of bonding or slashing really in there. The major assumption is that behind, behind the protocol is that if a block uh, producer misbehaves, it will not give be voted again in the next election, which happens every two minutes. And the question I want to ask to the audience or food for thought, is that how do, you, how do you, you as a token holder or participator in delegated proof of stake, how do you find out if a block producer is actually misbehaving? Is it realistic to assume that our token holders have enough tools, first of all, to detect, and secondly, the right incentives to act upon it? Let's take a look at different uh, set of, of proof of stake variants. In particular, liquid proof of stake used on protocols such as Tezos, bonded proof of stake for Cosmos, uh, nominated Polkadot, and in this case, I've also added Casper FFG. Um, a way of classifying them would be looking into which, which kind of consensus mechanism they pair up with. Um, with that, we have liquid proof of stake, which uh, relies on the Kamada consensus. Then we have another set of, um, of ones that rely on different interpretation of BFT consensus, those are bonded and nominated. And Casper is a special case, it's a hybrid between, it's a hybrid that mixes proof of work with proof of stake with uh, BFT. So in Tezos, validators need to bond at least 10,000 XTZ to participate in consensus. By a lottery-like system, bakers are assigned block validation and endorsement slots, should a double sign or double endorsed blocks, they can lose up to a maximum of the total self-bonded. On the other hand, bakers are awarded by every block they bake or in every endorsement they make. And the validator set is recalculated every cycle, which is two to three natural days in Tesla's time. In bonded proof of stake, um, using networks such as Cosmos, IrisNet, or any network that uses the Cosmos SDK, in order to become a validator, you need a cell phone that ranks enough to be one of the top 100 by, by uh, economic stake. Validators are assigned block validation slots via weighted round robin. And the most important distinction between LPOS and BPOS is that delegations are also at stake. Meaning that if a validator on Cosmos double signs or goes offline too often, the maximum amount they can lose is the total bond plus delegated. Because BPOS uses tandem consensus, which is a type of BFT consensus, not liveness is punished. Um, as if more than a third of a network is not online, the network just holds until consensus is reached by a lot of them coming online. Finally, the, validation, the validating set is recalculated at the end of every block. In Polkadot, proof of stake is grossly described on the white paper but the specific parameters um, and features are yet to be determined. Some distinctions that can make between BPOS and MPOS is the introduction with two different actors. Those are collators and fishermen. And then later election happens less, fre less frequently, something around every quarter in a year. And then the consensus is inspired by, some, by a mix between tandem consensus and honey budget BFT. Um, however, it seems that from what I heard from some recent discussions, NPOS is tending towards becoming a hybrid um, mechanism, something in the combination of uh, BFC and Nakamoto consensus, just like Casper. Casper FFG is a special case uh, because its purpose is to transition Ethereum, Ethereum's proof of stake, to a pro uh, Ethereum's proof of work to proof of stake via a multi step process. The initial version of Casper FFG maintains before work, but introduces a checkpoint, uh, introduces checkpoints of specific block heights. These checkpoints are produced with uh, signatures of proof of stake validators, and uh, whose voting power is proportional to the total amount they have to stake. 
um, and it could be it could start from any value. However, if a validator double signs sort of a vote, the entire stake will be slashed. The validator set is determined dynamically using what they call the dynasties. And while validating rewards are not how many how many how much validators uh, earn in Casper is not determined yet, there is a feature that gives a person a node that submits uh, evidence of another another known misbehaving. If you do that, then you will receive something like what they call the finder fee. And the last talk topic today is the role of token holders. Before proof of stake networks came alive, token holders could buy, sell, spend it, or huddle. With proof of stake networks going into production, huddling is an action that is discouraged by the protocol because there is a rate of inflation every year through rewards, which are only which are received by only people who participate directly in consensus as validators or indirectly as delegators. If you're just huddling and you have tokens in any of these networks, the value of the tokens will slowly be diluted away by this inflation. Now there are, now there are two, state, two, two new stakeholders in so blockchain ecosystems, and token holders can become a validating node and participate directly in consensus, or a delegator, in, the, in which case they would do it indirectly. Most of the state networks are also pursuing something called on-chain governance, which is a feature that enables um, a voting system on-chain on decisions involving future protocol upgrades. In some protocols, only validated nodes can cast votes on future proposals, which will be proportional to the stake. And in some other cases, the delegator can override the vote of the validator in case they're not aligned. Now, the only takeaway I believe that matters um, from this entire talk is that uh, is this one. Protocol developers are not stressing enough on how much the security and decentralization of proof of state networks rely on token holders. For example, how decentralizes Tezos if 75%, let's imagine, that all bakers are using cloud instances on Amazon? Or how Cosmos will be ever useful, regardless of how many transactions per second it can process, if um, if more than a third of a network is offline all the time and the network holds frequently. So if you choose to become a validator, you can contribute to more secure and decentralized validating set by, for example, setting your infrastructure in an uncommon geographical area, building tools that can prevent certain attacks, such as what we're doing, we're working on something related to Eclipse attacks, or doing research into how to improve security and submit protocol proposals. If you choose to delegate, it's on your hand to incentivize validating nodes with the best properties. Especially for delegators, I recommend reading our letter to current and future delegators. They can be found on Medium blog, which explain with more detail the importance of the role. And here's a list of resources that I recommend reading if you're doing some proof of stake research. And these slides will be available as some, some people taking pictures. Uh, it will be available in our GitHub repository under github.com cryptium, uh, cryptium labs slash library. Yeah, more for the future. So you'll find it there. And if you have any questions um, regarding the contents of this talk about delegation services, there's some, um, you can find some information on our main website or on Tezos portal. But I'm gonna be around Epicenter and Sesc. So if you find somebody with Crypto Labs t-shirt on, just grab that person and ask. It can be anything about um, protocol, protocols work. If you, have, if you think of becoming a validator or a delegator and you have questions about any details on economics or technically how these protocols work, just grab us. And else you can shoot an email to uh, awa at crypto.ch or find us on social media. Thank you.